Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 virtual Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm Ranger Raider Lane. I'm the coordinator for the Grand Canyon Star Party for the National Park Service. And for 30 years running, Grand Canyon has been celebrating our pristine night skies through this annual event we call the Grand Canyon Star Party. You know, ordinarily we invite hundreds of astronomers and thousands upon thousands of visitors to the park to enjoy eight nights of some of the darkest night skies in the United States. Each evening is typically kicked off with a special guest speaker in our theater, followed by telescope viewing, constellation tours, night sky photography workshops, and much, much more. Next year's Grand Canyon Star Party is June 5th through the 12th, 2021. So mark your calendars and cross your fingers that we will be able to celebrate on site next year. This year, we're gonna bring you a taste of Grand Canyon Star Party in the virtual realm. We wanna to try to mirror how a night at Grand Canyon Star Party might unfold on site. So we're, we're really lucky to start each evening from June 13th through the 20th this year with one of our special guest speakers who have all been willing to share their talks online with us. We're also excited to bring you some of the wonders of the summer night sky into your homes with our virtual telescope viewing sessions that will premiere right after this program. So stay tuned for those. And before we introduce our special guest speaker this evening, I just have a couple entities the National Park Service would like to thank for their support uh, in this event. First, I wanna thank the Grand Canyon Conservancy. Now, this is the park's a uh, nonprofit official partner. They're doing incredible things for the park. I mean, some of their current priorities include trail restoration, uh, the Desert View Intertribal Heritage Site, an amazing project unfolding at the Desert View Watchtower area. They fund research and education in the park. And of course, one of their biggest priorities is night sky preservation. Through the generous support of Grand Canyon Conservancy and their supporters, Grand Canyon National Park was able to inventory over 5,000 lights in the park over the last few years. We were able to retrofit over 1,500 of those fixtures to be night sky friendly. So we changed out many, uh, many of these fixtures to, to be dark sky friendly. We have plans to retrofit many, many more in the future. And this allowed us to become certified in 2019 as an international dark sky park which makes us undoubtedly one of the largest, most complex, highly visited international dark sky parks in the world. Now that very same year in 2019, the park was awarded the distinction of International Dark Sky Place of the Year by the International Dark Sky Association. Now this is the nonprofit entity that certifies parks and communities as international dark sky places, among a whole host of other things that they do. In fact, the International Dark Sky Association's mission is to preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies through environmentally responsible outdoor lighting. We thank the International Dark Sky Association, their tremendous staff and their tremendous work, and we really hope they keep up the great work. Finally, Grand Canyon's International Dark Sky Place of the Year could not have been achieved without the dedication, the passion, and the expertise of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. They're our essential partner for the Grand Canyon Star Party, and in our virtual star party following this presentation, please go into the chat room and thank the astronomers. They're gonna be populating the chat room, asking questions, answering questions, and they do this out of pure love of the night skies on a, on a pure volunteer basis. The National Park Service is really proud to partner with them in this endeavor. And with that, I wanna to introduce tonight's special guest speaker. Tonight, we are really lucky to have Dr. John Barentine with us. John is the Director of Public Policy for the International Dark Sky Association, and he comes to the association from the dark side of science, professional astronomy. He obtained a master's degree in physics at Colorado State University and master's and doctoral degrees in astronomy at the University of Texas at Austin. From 2001 to 2006, he was on the staff of the Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico, serving as both an observing specialist on the Astrophysical Research Consortium 3.5 meter telescope and as, as an observer for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. John has con contributed to science in fields ranging from solar physics to galaxy evolution while helping develop hardware for ground-based and aircraft-borne astronomy. Throughout his career, he's been involved in education and outreach efforts to help increase the public understanding of science. In addition to his work for the International Dark Sky Association, John is a member of the steering committee of the University of Utah Consortium for Dark Sky Studies, 
a member of the American Astronomical Society Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Interference, and Space Debris, a member of the International Astronomical Union, and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. He is the author of two books on the history of uh, astronomy, The Lost Constellations and The Uncharted Constellations, and the asteroid 14505 Varentine is named in his honor. Tonight, John will present Dark Skies in Isolation, while, while, why the fight to protect the night is more important than ever. John, thanks so much for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you for having me again, Raider. It's um, always a pleasure. So let me go ahead and start this up on my end and put myself up here in the corner. Okay, well thanks once again uh, to Grand Canyon National Park, Park Service, Grand Canyon Conservancy, and everybody else who makes this possible. Uh, it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be invited to come back and speak again at the Grand Canyon Star Party. And normally in these years uh, that I've been participating, I come and I give a general presentation about dark skies and my work with the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, but of course this year is different and it's different for all of us. Uh, and that has caused me to kind of step back and think a little bit differently about this and reconsider the notion of what it means to protect dark skies uh, in the, the world that's emerging on the other side of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so that's why my title uh, tonight is Dark Skies in Isolation. Uh, and you know, what are we learning from this? What can this teach us? And, and why is it in fact more important than ever to protect the night sky? So in the next about 25 or 30 minutes, uh, this is what we will walk through. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk to you about the phenomenon of light pollution and how it is causing us to lose of the nighttime environment all over the world. Um, I'll talk a little bit about stargazing in this pandemic and what this has meant to people. Then going on to what isolation is teaching us about darkness and its value in our lives and ultimately how I think that we can solve this problem. So first I want to talk to you about what it means to when I say that we're losing the night. Uh, this is the scene uh, at a typical Grand Canyon star party if you've never attended before. Uh, this uh, is where the astronomers are set up. The visitor center at the South Rim is in the background, lit up in the, the red light that we use to help preserve night vision. You can see a telescope in the foreground. And then of course, there's that incredible, beautiful night sky in the background. Um, this is what we come for every year. We love to see these night skies and it's crucial that we have places like the Grand Canyon to help protect uh, the darkness where it still exists. Uh, but of course, we could not do that this year because of the pandemic and the need to enforce some distance between us and maybe not have some of these in-person events uh, until uh, we get a little better handle on what all this means for us. So this is why we come. This is what we uh, would like to see continue. And we know that, that we will be together again at the Grand Canyon in future years uh, and that we will all enjoy the star party again. Um, so it's, a, it's good that we've been able to adapt to this uh, program of presentations and even night sky observing to the virtual realm. Uh, and this is a, a, a sign of things to come. But this year, this isn't exactly how we will be experiencing the star party. And a long time ago, every human shared this experience of this pristine night sky. And this picture here is meant to sort of suggest what this is like. A long time ago, and I know this is hard for some people to believe, but there was no internet. And people watched television, at least here in the West. And before there was television, people would sit around at night after work was done for the day, after the evening meal, and they would maybe listen to the radio. And in a time before that, people might read books at night. But there was a time before books, and there was a time before written language. And the result of this is that we spend a lot of time outdoors. And in those outdoor spaces, we sat around campfires. And those campfires were our connection to each other in that primeval darkness. It's how we recognized each other as humans in the dark. And it was a place for us to gather, to share the warmth and the light of the fire. It was also useful for preparing our food. Uh, and this is where probably a lot of the beginnings of human culture occurred. When we sat around the fire and we told stories. We bonded with each other as a species. But eventually the fire begins to die down late into the evening. And as it does, people naturally turn towards looking up into the night sky. And when they did that, they would have seen something like this. 
They would have seen stars from horizon to horizon, perhaps the Milky Way through the middle of the, the field of view. Uh, just an absolutely uh, astounding and awe-inspiring experience. In fact, the night sky has inspired great works of art and literature, poetry, and music for literally thousands of years of our human history. Uh, and this is something that connects us to nature in a way that I think very few things do uh, and have throughout our history as human beings. Um, I'm a child of the, the 80s. I was inspired like uh, many kids who eventually went into science and technology careers by people like Carl Sagan. And I, I love this quotation of his, make sure that, uh, that I'm not running over it here, um, about the earth being the shore of the cosmic ocean and that some part of our being knows this is where we came from and that we want to return. That is what drives our exploration of the earth and of space. And he's very well known for having made this quote about that we are made of star stuff, which is quite literally true. But all of the atoms that are on the earth, except for a handful of the hydrogen that's in our atmosphere, uh, all was processed in the interiors of previous generations of stars. And as he says, we are away for the cosmos to know itself. As far as we are aware, this is the first time in the history of the universe where the material that makes up the universe itself has become self-aware and has begun asking questions like why and how. And it is our immediate connection with this cosmos through the viewing of the night sky that connects us to that billions of years of history, to borrow a, a phrase of, of his, uh, uh, that is something that is absolutely, I think, essential to our existence as humans on this planet. Um, but it's not that way for everybody anymore. And now, as I like to say when I present scenes like this one, which is looking over the Los Angeles basin at night here in, in the United States, is that now we see through a glass darkly. And this is an intentional turn of phrase that was originally meant to refer to a, a, a dark image seen in a poorly made mirror. But instead now of a poor reflection of light, what we're seeing is an addition of light into our environment at night that's making it difficult to see what is beyond. So that kind of orange haze in the sky is not itself air pollution. It's light from the ground that's scattering off of small particles and molecules in the atmosphere and forming something that we call sky glow over the city. And as you notice, this, this is a nighttime scene, but you can't really see any stars in the background because of this sky glow, which is sort of a, a veil in front of our eyes. And because it lowers the contrast between the stars and the blackness of space beyond them, it makes it difficult for us to see those stars. And if you're in a city the size of Los Angeles on a clear night, you might see as few stars in the night sky as you could count realistically on two hands. You see the moon, maybe a bright planet, a handful of the brightest stars, and that's it. The rest of the cosmos is uh, hidden from view by this veil of light that comes from the ground. But it doesn't have to be this way. And this is not a uniquely, in this case, California problem. It's not here where the Grand Canyon is located. It's not an American problem. It's not even a Western problem. What you're seeing in this image is a map of the entire Earth as if it were night everywhere at once. This is made over the course of about a year by satellites orbiting the Earth, looking down at night and taking images. And through carefully selecting images on nights when there were no clouds in a particular area, NASA has been able to piece together this mosaic impression of the Earth at night. The continents are lit up by moonlight, which kind of has a blue color. Uh, the oceans are dark, of course, but you can see the evidence of human activity all over this map, with the exception of Antarctica. On every other continent, we see indications of light. And we know that this is a problem that has gotten worse as time goes by. Uh, in a long ago era, if you look down on the earth at night, other than the glow of maybe wildfires or thunderstorms with lightning, you would not have seen any light on the night side of Earth, but now this light is abundant. And as I will show you a little bit later, uh, the astronauts aboard the International Space Station, for example, uh, can see the glow of our cities quite brightly with their own eyes from low Earth orbit. 
I'm going to use this word light pollution repeatedly throughout the presentation, and I thought it would be useful to give a definition of this. There's no universally accepted definition of light pollution. This is just the one that I like uh, the best because I think it really conveys the sense of what we mean by the words. And that's any adverse effect or impact attributable to the use of artificial light at night. We generally tend to consider that in outdoor spaces specifically. Uh, there is indoor artificial light at night, and that is a separate concern, but mainly we're interested in the impact of this light in outdoor spaces at night. So when I talk about light pollution, I'll be talking about artificial sources of light, not natural ones, and uh, predominantly in outdoor spaces. What I can tell you about artificial light at night uh, and the uh, associated light pollution is that really it is growing out of control. Uh, that should be artificial light at night. Uh, this is probably the most technical part of the whole presentation, so hang with me here for just a moment. What I'm showing you is a figure from a paper that was published a couple of years ago that looked at five years worth of data from artificial satellites orbiting the Earth and measuring the brightness of the Earth on a country by country basis during those five years. And the scientists who published this article asked two questions here, and those are represented by the two maps. One of them, which is on the left, is for each country, how much of that country's land area shows indications of light in our measurements. And they looked at that as a rate of change. So as the colors on the map get warmer, that means that there was a greater change during the five-year study period. They also looked at another way of visualizing the question, which is how much quantity of light is being detected by those Earth-orbiting satellites. That's this thing called radiance on map B. And once again, you'll notice that most of the countries there uh, are shown in the warmer colors, meaning that they are growing. In both of these quantities, both the lit area and the radiance, or the total amount of light, are growing at the rate of about 2% a year if you average them over the whole Earth. There's some countries where it is growing faster than that, even into the double digits. You will notice that there are a few countries on here that are shown in gray, where there's no data, or blue even, that indicates a decrease. Some of those are fairly prominent, like Australia over here on the left. Uh, there were bushfires in Australia during part of the study period, but not in others. So it is an apparent decrease in the area of light because the, there's not, not any immediate ability to discriminate natural from artificial sources. But also these maps are telling us something important about us as a species and our activities. You notice that some of the countries that light up on uh, both of these maps is decreasing are in the Middle East, countries like Syria and Yemen, which were both affected by civil war during the period of time in which the data were collected. Um, so, but by and large, we see that uh, light pollution is definitely on the increase and it's happening almost over the entire world. So you might ask why this matters. Why am I telling you about this? Well, on the one hand, you could say, whether or not we can see the sky at night doesn't seem to be very important. It's not something that has imminence to a lot of people in the world. Some people like to see it because it's sort of aesthetically pleasing or they're stargazers or amateur astronomers. But remember that I told you that that light that makes its way into the night sky originates on the ground. And when that light is on the ground, it has distinct impacts on a variety of issues. Here are just four of those. And I think the reason that it's important to bring this up is that almost everybody can identify with one or more of these topics, whether it's the night sky or the issue of how uh, light at night interacts with crime or how we're gonna provide energy to meet our demands moving into the future, knowing that light pollution represents a form of energy waste. And of course, there's a, a tremendous impact on wildlife. The ecology is very sensitive to light at night because uh, most species on this earth evolved in a time when there was no artificial light at night. And so they are really governed by the cycle of the rising and setting of the sun that establishes a 24-hour rhythm. And adding artificial light at night into these spaces is disrupting that rhythm. And it's presenting a very serious challenge to the wildlife species that live there. So without going into too much detail here, I can assure you that the issue of light pollution is touching on all of these areas of uh, concern, be it scientific or ecological or social. And so there are a lot of good reasons why we should address this 
beyond just our ability to see the stars. So why is all of this happening? That may be the next question that you're thinking. How did we end up in this place that we're in with a light polluted earth? And I think it comes down to these three fairly simple ideas. We simply use a lot more light than we probably need in order to attend to our very legitimate needs at night. And that's something that my organization has been about from the very beginning. Our mission is not to turn the world's lights off. Our mission is to try to convince the world to make better and maybe different use of this resource that it already has so that we ensure that there will be enough of it in the future without creating additional problems for us here on the ground. A lot of the overuse of light is coming from a sense of wastefulness, that we uh, are deploying light in ways that aren't, isn't helping anybody. It's not creating conditions for people to transit safely from place to place at night, or it's not facilitating nighttime commerce. Uh, it's just going into the night sky, and it doesn't really benefit anybody when it ends up there. And ultimately, we think that this sense of wastefulness is really brought on by a lack of awareness. Uh, there are very few instances where I talk to people about these issues, and they, they fail to recognize that what I'm referring to is the waste of a resource. It's light that's not benefiting somebody. We want to keep the light where it's needed on the ground and out of the night sky. It's that simple. If we paid attention to that kind of concern, um, we could very easily solve this problem. And one of the best aspects of dealing with the problem is that unlike a lot of other forms of environmental pollution, we can see the results immediately when we decide to do something about it. It's not so much like air or water or soil pollution where you could stop the emission of the pollutant, but then you have to wait years or sometimes even decades for that pollutant to work its way out of the natural system. In this case, the pollutant leaves at the speed of light and we begin to immediately see uh, the benefits of restoring the nighttime environment. So how has this changed as a result of COVID-19? What is different in our world now than a year ago when I presented at the Grand Canyon Star Party and the sense of isolation was the furthest thing from anybody's mind? Well, for one thing, it has driven a lot of people to go look at the night sky. Some of them maybe for the first time in their lives. This is a selection of just a handful of headlines of articles in the popular media that have run in recent weeks in reaction to all of the lockdown orders and the isolation that have um, had to be affected in order for us to safeguard ourselves against the worst of this pandemic. People are at home. They're spending time outside at night. Uh, again, many of them perhaps for the first time. And they're finding that there's a night sky there and that there's something to see even when they live in places like light polluted cities. There's something for them to go look at and that it's an activity that they can join in with their children so that we're handing off this reverence for the night to the next generation. So stargazing is looking up right now, mainly because a lot of people are in circumstances that they didn't expect to find themselves in. And they're looking for connection to that outside world even as we have had to stay in for the benefit of our society. But at the same time, there's some worrying trends that are involved here. Here's a headline from the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago. The surge in anxiety and depression shows coronavirus toll on mental health in America. This is not limited to the United States, of course, because much of the rest of the world has had to endure the same sense of lockdown uh, so that we can get a handle on the pandemic. And that, this is not good for us, ultimately. You know, we're, as humans, we're very social creatures. Our well-being depends on our ability to interact with other people. And for the moment, that's been taken away from us. And so what the night sky is offering us right now, what stargazing can do and a connection with the night, is to help alleviate some of that sense of being alone and maybe bring us back to asking some of the greatest questions that we face as humans on this planet. You know, where did we come from? How did our species end up here? What is the universe made of? How will it evolve in the future? And a lot of these things are, are of course, the, the big, tough scientific questions for the professionals. But I think everyone has some sense of wonder and that they can be moved by these questions, even as they consider what the answers are for themselves. For some people, that's spiritual. For some, it is appreciation of the science of the night sky. But there's something in this, I think, for everybody. And it could be something that helps us get through this, uh, both individually and collectively as a society. 
So the question has come up as to whether all of this isolation and this lockdown has done anything for the night sky. Um, some people have suggested that maybe because people are staying in and businesses have been closed, they haven't been running as many lights on their building exteriors at night to try to save a little bit of money. And there might be some evidence for that. I'm going to show you some slides that were graciously provided to me by Dr. Chris Elvidge of the Earth Observation Group at the Colorado School of Mines. And Dr. Elvidge has been a leader for decades in the satellite measurement of light at night on the Earth. He's one of the pioneers. And he and his team have been looking at measurements of cities all over the world during the time of the lockdowns to see if our satellites are sensing any changes. And interestingly enough, it seems like they have. These are some preliminary results that he allowed me to share with you for a couple of world cities. Uh, so here's Los Angeles. I showed you the picture earlier of the LA skyline with sky glow above it. And what you're seeing is if we take two adjacent periods of time from satellite observations and we just subtract one from the other. So in the color scheme here, if a region has gotten less bright, it shows up as red. If on the other hand, a region gets more bright, it shows up as this cyan or sort of turquoise color. And what Dr. Elvidge is showing is the month of February of 2020, subtracting off March of 2020. So this is where the changes become evident by taking one month and subtracting the other. And you notice that being one of the first US states to go into lockdown, that there seems to be a definite decrease in the brightness of the night sky, or at least the amount of light being emitted on the ground uh, in the Southern California region. So this seems to suggest that there, people were participating in the lockdown effectively, is that they were staying in and using less light. We're not yet 100% sure if this does translate to a, a less bright night sky. There are some studies that are ongoing. I think we will get some results before the end of the year. Uh, but this is encouraging. Maybe people saw more stars in LA when they went out at night uh, than they would have ordinarily. Uh, here's another example from elsewhere in the world where the uh, efficiency seemed to be a little bit higher. This is Delhi in India, one of the biggest cities in the world. And you'll notice that not only the, the urban core of Delhi, but also these outlying satellite suburbs also decreased in brightness during that same period of time while there was a lockdown in India. Uh, and even in China, where the pandemic originated earlier this year, or in late 2019, uh, here's one of the biggest cities in China, which is Shanghai. And you can see in, there's three periods of time here. So they're looking at adjacent months and subtracting one off the other. And the dimming began in 2020, right in January, almost as soon as uh, the Chinese cities went into the lockdown. It expanded during February. But you'll notice that by March 2020, when the lockdown restrictions were lifted, now you're beginning to see green on the map. And again, green signifies the areas where uh, there's more light detected from space than there was before. So this shows a sense of a city coming sort of back to life, coming, returning to work, leaving home, uh, and getting back to normal. Um, and this really presents an opportunity here that we should think about because there are some changes that we might make that are not as disruptive as, as a true lockdown. We don't have to confine people to their homes. We don't have to shut down businesses. But we can reduce light consumption maybe make the night sky over some of these cities just a little bit darker and do it in a way that doesn't come with the, the uh, economic trouble that's associated with shutting down an economy. We certainly don't want to do that. Uh, but I'm suggesting that we can make some modest gains if, again, we just change the way that we think about all of this artificial light at night that we're using already. So this gives me a little bit of hope, the sense that uh, even though this is not exactly the way that we, we think it would unfold in practice, that it is possible to reduce some city light emissions and that we can see the results of that from our uh, space-based uh, observations. Meanwhile, uh, nature is reclaiming the night. There are various stories in the media about the reappearance of wildlife, both in the day and at night, uh, that have not been seen in some places for decades or maybe 100 years. And the reduced human presence certainly is one of those things, but to the extent that nocturnal animals are coming back, the nighttime dwellers of our cities, I think it's a reflection of the fact that there's been less light on the ground, just like the satellite observations imply, and that this is creating a space in which these animals feel safe in reclaiming. They're coming back into the margins of cities. And you might think if you're a city dweller that you don't have an urban ecology, but I guarantee you that you do. 
and that it is interconnected both day and night to our activities in cities. And so as we talk about things like sustainability and how we're going to make our cities livable into the indefinite future, we do need to be thinking about the nocturnal habitat for these creatures and ensuring that we're having the least impact as possible so as to keep these ecosystems functional and healthy. And lastly, for this little bit of part of the presentation, you might have even seen some of these stories like this one from Sky News in Britain. Uh, shows up every now and then in the media. These idealized uh, cityscapes that are presented against a, a more or less unpolluted night sky. This is, you know, as you've never seen these cities before, if you just removed the light pollution, I think this is kind of carrying it to somewhat of a, an absurd extreme. I, I don't think that we're going to see this kind of a display of the Milky Way over Manhattan in the future. There are just too many people who live there, and there are, again, very legitimate uses of light at night that are always going to be with us, and we will not necessarily be able to, to solve this problem in an absolute sense, but we can certainly make the situation better. Is there a future in which I can see it possible to view the Milky Way from Central Park in Manhattan? Sure, there is. Uh, you know, any city in the world could do this, and it can do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize public safety uh, or disadvantage anybody. We can still provide plenty of light for those legitimate uses on the ground. So scenes like this are not real realistic, uh, and, and they're maybe a bit beyond the goals that we can reasonably achieve, um, but it reminds us that the outcomes that we have now are not inevitable, and that there are opportunities where at least in small ways that we can change this. So what are the lessons about darkness that isolation has been teaching us for the last couple of months? Well, for one, of course, right now we are apart, but one of the things that can still bring us together as a society or as a culture, even if not physically, is the shared love for the night and the night sky and the nighttime environment. Uh, again, the, the, a light polluted world is not a necessary outcome of the march of technology and progress. We can think differently about the ways that we use light and have the conveniences that we have come to enjoy and expand access to those places in underserved parts of the world. But we can do it without necessarily resulting in a lot more light pollution. But we have to start with something that we share and that we love. And I'm reminded of uh, one of the quotations that's sort of central to the, the modern conservation movement. And this is by a man named Baba Diom, who is from the country of Senegal in West Africa, at a meeting of the International Union for the Conservation in 1968, uh, Conservation of Nature. Uh, he said, in the end, we can serve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So if we want to conserve the night and protect it, we have to understand it, but we're only going to understand it if we make an effort uh, to learn it, and we need to be taught that. And that's something that there's room in this for experts to teach us. There's room for us to teach each other about this value that we can hold as a society. Uh, and if we do, I think the, the future of uh, dark skies is actually quite good, and there are reasons to believe that more people than ever are paying attention to this issue and that they care about it. We're also learning that distant parks, such as the Grand Canyon, are not really isolated. And it's kind of a, a funny or ironic uh, sort of a twist on this idea of social isolation. You know, we can retreat to our homes, but the light from our cities doesn't stay near us when we do. What I'm showing you in this picture is a map of something that's called the artificial light ratio. And it's just a, a measure of how much human-caused light is in the night sky. So at any point on the map, the color is telling you, relatively speaking, how light polluted is the night sky at that place. And this is the southwestern United States. It's centered on Grand Canyon National Park. You can see all of the areas outlined with those green lines are all public lands out here in the western US. The state boundaries are in red, and I've indicated around the image which states they are. And you can see these rainbow arrays of color around the bigger cities. And I can uh, put some labels on those cities so you see what they are. And you notice that these bigger cities like Los Angeles and you know, Las Vegas, famous for being a city of light, really push the boundaries of these bright areas out very quite far. The brightest areas on the map are in the sort of pink to a, a white color in the center. 
And the darkest areas where there is still pristine darkness at night are black. So you do have to go to a place like the Grand Canyon or to its north, the Colorado Plateau in southern Utah, or into the Great Basin region of Nevada in the upper left in order to find this natural darkness that's not spoiled by human light. But every year, this glow from the cities expands out a little bit further, and it compresses or squeezes these regions where there still is darkness left. You'll notice in the lower left corner, a bit to the right of the label for Los Angeles, there's an area in the eastern desert of California that's still pretty dark blue, but it's not black. And even there, the glow from Las Vegas and Los Angeles, and even on some nights from Phoenix, can be seen. So these dark places, which tend to overlap with our public lands and our national parks, uh, are really under threat right now from the glow of cities. And that means that the decisions that we make now in our cities, hundreds of miles away from parks, are going to continue to affect the visibility of the night skies. And I hope that's an incentive for us to make changes in our cities that will help protect those distant parks. At the same time, our cities are more together than ever before. Our cities are less isolated. Here's the same kind of map with the same color scheme, but now this time it's showing the eastern United States with some of the cities labeled. And you'll notice that there is very little black on this map. You have to go almost uh, over to the, the right out over the Atlantic Ocean to find any areas of pristine darkness near the eastern U.S. states. And, and again, it's a, there's much more population in the eastern states, and communities are generally closer together than they are here in the west. But a consequence of that, when you add light pollution onto it, is that there are really no naturally dark places left in that part of the country, or at least none that really reach that pristine level. And again, that impacts all of those issues that I brought up earlier. Think about if you're a migrating bird uh, running through uh, migratory routes in the Appalachian Mountains, and it's hard to find the darkness that you need to navigate by the stars. So again, it's something that doesn't just affect our cities. It has a reach much further away than that. And in certain parts of our country and elsewhere in the world, the natural darkness has already been squeezed out of existence. But again, this doesn't have to be the outcome. We could have a different result if we decide to have it. And lastly, for this part, even in isolation, our collective light blinds us. This is a view actually from our International Dark Sky Reserve in the Rhone region of central Germany. And it's on a night when there's some low-lying clouds or fog in the foreground that are blanketing these individual villages. And you can see each village is a little uh, speck of light in this foreground. And there's the Milky Way above in the sky beyond it. But of course, the people on the ground, they can't see it. And that's not only because of the cloud or the fog, but also because of the light in their villages. It's probably too bright uh, in the village along the main street, for example, to be able to see it. But if you step a little bit outside of that, uh, that sense of isolation is keeping something from us because it's a sort of collective sense of blindness. We don't see the night sky slipping away from our, even our rural communities as slowly as it has over the last few decades. Uh, and it's something that gradually goes away can be almost unnoticed. So hopefully what isolation is teaching us about darkness is that it's a time to reflect. And again, to think about how we're using light. Could we use it differently? Could we bring back scenes a little more like this where we see the Milky Way overhead if we use that light differently? And my hope is that we can. So how do we do that? In the last section of my presentation, I'm gonna give you some of the, the practical solutions to this problem, because I do believe it is something that can be solved once we decide as a society that we want a different outcome. And I said that I was gonna show you an image from the International Space Station. I always put this one in my presentation because it, it is often shocking to people when they find out exactly what it is. But this is a view of the Earth at night from the window of the space station in a photograph that was taken by an astronaut a few years ago. And it shows a particular part of the world. Uh, there's obviously a lot of light in this picture, especially in the center. It looks like what's a very big city, which it turns out that it is. Uh, but there's also a lot of darkness in the, the margins. And so the light that you see towards the lower right 
fourth or so of the image. Um, you might be forgiven if you thought that was an island surrounded by ocean, and maybe some of the other blips of light around it are uh, boats or fishing vessels or something like that. Um, and then I put this overlay up, and sometimes the crowd will gasp when they realize what's going on here. And all I've done is I've drawn in the, the land boundary, uh, the edge of North Korea, and labeled their capital cities. So the light that you saw in the previous image before I put up the labels is coming from South Korea. Um, the apparent darkness uh, above it is, uh, is a country of tens of millions of people. And this is not the way that we suggest that the problem should be solved. We don't think this is a reasonable approach. We think that people should choose these solutions freely and democratically, and it should be the express will of the people. Um, you know, this is not meant to be uh, flippant. Uh, it, it truly, there are better ways of uh, dealing with this problem than uh, taking these very extreme measures. And we want to make sure that it's done in a way that is fair and is just and is equitable for people. And we think that that can be accomplished. So how do we realistically solve this problem? We've boiled this down into six main points. And if everybody out there in the world in a position to decide something about outdoor lighting, were to be mindful of these six ideas, I think we would solve the problem of light pollution in a hurry. And they are things that sound like common sense. You know, put the light where it is needed and not in other places. For example, don't shine light on your neighbor's property. Uh, keep it on your property where it is needed and let your neighbors decide for themselves how best to light their own property. Only use as much light as you need and pay attention to the energy efficiency of the lighting as much as possible. Point those lights down towards the ground and put shields on them so that the light doesn't go into the night sky. You know, use that light when you need it. And we have many technological solutions to this now, uh, to things that are as simple as mechanical timers. If nobody will be around at a particular time of night and you, you know that to be the case, turn the light off. Put it on a motion sensing switch, for example, so that the light is only there when people are around to need it. That actually conveys a bit of an advantage for security purposes as well. And this number five right here is the one that is maybe the least familiar to people. We talk about warm sources of light. It turns out that very cool or blue looking light uh, is the most hazardous to the nighttime environment, both for sky glow and the ability to see the stars, but also for wildlife. Uh, and even for ourselves, our, our well-being as humans is tuned to the color of the light that we see at night. So we encourage people to use warm sources that don't have so much blue. What you want is a lamp that doesn't look very much like daylight, because daylight is a signal to uh, animals and plants uh, that they should be awake and they should be doing their normal daytime activities, whereas they need to rest at night. They need to sleep just like we do, even plants. Uh, and the best way to do that is to use sources of light that do not resemble sunlight very much. So if we were to stick to this set of principles and apply them pretty consistently, I think we could solve these problems. So does it work? This is a question that I get a lot. You know, if we implement these ideas, can we expect to see changes? And the answer is yes. We've tested that out here in my own community. When we changed our street lighting system in Tucson over from an older technology called high pressure sodium vapor to the new LED technology that you have probably heard about, we did this a few years ago, we were very careful about the way that we implemented that change, in part because we have a number of astronomical observatories near Tucson that depend on darkness in order to be able to do their scientific research. So we monitored the progress of this change, and we found that in fact, the brightness of the night sky over the city decreased a little bit. And we did that without uh, any risk to public safety. We've seen no meaningful change in the number of traffic accidents, for example, or rate of incidence of overnight crime. And our city is saving much more money uh, through reduced consumption of energy as a result. Uh, it's really win, win, win all the way around. Uh, and there are lots of reasons to believe that, that other communities can realize the same type of savings that we have here. Um, so we really encourage people to look at examples like Tucson uh, and for cities to consider making similar changes as a result. So the idea that I'm going to leave you with here is what has come out of this experience over the last few months of being apart from each other and being indoors, but occasionally stepping out to take a look at the night sky 
is that we're more interdependent than we realized before and that the future of our nights and our night sky depends on the choices that we make today. And that none of these uh, adverse outcomes that I've discussed is inevitable. We can all do something, even if it's as small as considering the need for the lights on the exteriors of our own homes and making improvements to them that will contribute in meaningful ways to reducing the influence of artificial light at night and make our nights a, a better and uh, more inviting place to be in and maybe give us something to think about when we look up in the night sky and ponder what it all means. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm gonna hand it back over to Raider. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, amazing presentation as always. We're, we're always so lucky to, to, to have you at the Grand Canyon Star Party and be able to, to share your, your wisdom and knowledge uh, to, to everyone. Um, so I have a million questions, but it's, it's really, it's really hard to, to, to pin it down. I, I guess I would just start with a little bit into some of the things that the International Dark Sky Association, uh, does, um, uh, a, a, as a, as, um, a, a nonprofit entity to, to help curb, um, and, and solve this problem that you just, you just were speaking Mm -hmm. That's a really great question, Raider. And we take three main approaches as an organization to addressing the problem. One of those is conservation, of course. So programs like International Dark Sky Places, which as you mentioned at the, the top of the broadcast, uh, is where the Grand Canyon received its designation from us recently, uh, is an important part of that, encouraging best practices in management of places like the Grand Canyon and other national parks where uh, the nighttime environment is very crucial for uh, the well-being of wildlife and for the visibility of the night sky. So we work a lot with uh, parks and organizations like the U.S. National Park Service on that. We work directly with the lighting industry to promote the manufacture and sale of more night sky friendly lighting equipment, which you also mentioned is part of the, the Grand Canyon uh, application for International Dark Sky Park status. So we promote through our fixture seal of approval program the kinds of lighting products that are uh, suitable for that purpose and help reduce light pollution. And then the third is our uh, public policy program in which uh, for communities and states and even countries, when that uh, consensus has been achieved, I said we want to try to do this through uh, th these democratic means uh, and, and it, people really embracing these changes, we help governments establish policies that sort of enshrine these ideas into law. And so there are kind of three legs of the stool that supports night sky conservation uh, programs through our, our organization. Well, that's amazing. And, and you guys are doing tremendous work, as I said earlier. And uh, I just, I hope you, you all keep it up. It's, it's, uh, you guys are just a wonderful uh, uh, organization. I just, I guess I have one, one more question for you, which is sort of coming from, uh, uh, you know, the, the astronomer or the, or the, the, just the stargazer in you. I mean, how, how crucial of uh, a role did night skies, pristine night skies play in your, uh, in your development as an astronomer? And, uh, you know, how do they continue to inspire you today? What is it, what, what is it about the night skies at Grand Canyon, for, for instance, that just keeps you, keeps you coming back up here? Well, I, I was fortunate to be born in the state, in Arizona, where, which is where the, the park is located. And uh, it's a state that has had a long history in astronomy, stretching back over 100 years to the founding of Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff in the 19th century, and continues today. We have some of the most advanced astronomy facilities in the world here in Arizona. Uh, and my own development as an astronomer is uh, traceable back to that. And having that experience growing up here as a kid, uh, being able to, to access those night skies and have that sense of wonder. Even though I grew up in the big city, uh, it's not far away. And that was uh, just something that was it, indispensable to the whole track that my life has been on since then. Um, what this means to me now, I think, again, uh, we, we live in extraordinary times. We live in, in times that are crucial to the future of our society and to our uh, species on this planet, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, our sense of connection to nature, or, or in cases where that connection has been damaged, uh, is extraordinarily important at this moment. We have in front of us this ability to really change the future, to change these outcomes. 
Uh, and again, so much of what we're trying to do here in the Dark Skies movement, so much of it is common sense. Um, so much of it is, is absolutely aligned with uh, these more sustainable ways of living uh, that also bring all the benefits to, of the, the level of economic development that we really want to see throughout the world because it has really changed the world. It's brought you know, billions of people out of poverty and there's no need to walk that back. Uh, I'm just excited about the prospects for the future right now, even as uncertain as the future sometimes seems. I think there's good reason to think that this effort is going to be successful in the future. And I think that really everybody in the world in their own way can benefit from it. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a, a crucial sense of awe that uh, the night sky can give us anywhere we are theoretically. And, uh, you know, to be, to be fortunate enough to, to be working at Grand Canyon National Park and, and um, be witness to these skies on, on a nightly basis. Um, I can tell you, uh, it's it, it, like you, it is, it's such an inspiring thing to, to aspire to. Uh, to 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 return this incredible sense of awe and and sublimity that we we could all experience and 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 give us a sense of humility in our lives and and uh, promote our well being that I think is as you say just crucial for this this uh, these extraordinary times that we're in. So once again, we can't uh, we can't thank you guys enough for your 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 incredible work, and we thank you for certifying Grand Canyon as an international dark sky park. Um, International Dark Sky Place of the Year in 2019. For everybody who uh, is listening now, please stay tuned for the virtual uh, Grand Canyon Star Party that's going to premiere just after this uh, program ends here. And hopefully for everybody watching, you'll be able to come to Grand Canyon next year for the 2021 Star Party happening June 5th through the 12th. So cross your fingers that we'll be able to celebrate on site and hopefully you all will be able to meet Dr. John Barentine as he is a, a, a familiar face up here at Grand Canyon Star Party. Um, and as you hopefully have just seen for, for obvious reasons, we, we really um, uh, respect, admire, and enjoy his presence up here. So John, thank you so much. We hope to see you uh, next year on site at the 2021 Grand Canyon Star Party. Thanks once again for the invitation. It is indeed a pleasure.